Do you believe that you can personally hear from God? Or do you think that we only hear from God through the Bible? I'm Crystal Roy with Kingdom Exchange, and I'm here to equip the saints to see what God is showing us, to see what he's doing, to hear what he's saying, and then to go do everything Jesus did and greater. Thank you for joining me today. So I want to share with you um, an experience that happened to me yesterday. But first, I want to set uh, I want to set the scene. <clears throat> now I have some I have some critics I'll call them uh, very gentlemanly so far, uh, but who like my Muslim friends believe that the only way God can speak to you is through the sacred book. So for the Muslims, it's the Quran, and for us, it's the Bible. But I want to share with you two passages and uh, challenge maybe some thinking on that. So uh, in 1 John 4, 7 through 21, oops, don't want to start there. I'm ahead of myself. So in uh, 1 Samuel 23, this is about David. And Verse uh, 4 says, once again, David inquired of the Lord. So that means he'd done it before. He was asking God something, something specific and personal, something that could not be found in the Torah. And God invites us. He said, call unto me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things, which means it's not written that you do not know. And this invitation did not go away with the death of the first disciples, the first apostles. But once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him. That's immediately. He didn't have to pray and fast and read the word for 21 days, for 40 days. <clears throat> which are great spiritual disciplines, but make sure they're not works. There's a big difference. And the Lord answered him, go down to Keilah, for I'm going to give you the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah, fought the Philistines and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. So God answered David's direct question, and he'll do that for you too. Now let's look at another example. So this passage started with, once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered. So we must inquire of the Lord because the Lord will answer. So let's look at 1 Samuel 38. That was 1 Samuel 23, and this one's 1 Samuel 38. And David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? This is a very specific question. God answered. Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So why am I bringing this up? I want to ask you a question. Um, who will you be today? We wear many hats. Um... I'm an author of uh, three published books. I have two more in the pipeline. Well, four, four more in the pipeline. I'm not an overachiever or anything, LOL. Um, that just, you know, 20 years of, of getting it together, right? And then an overnight success. Um, so in some of this, I am the realtor hat, right? And others, I am the pastor hat. And uh, a lot of times those are not very different. Um, I'm talking about land, ownership, authority on your land in both of these realms. Okay. And the Lord has, oh gosh, taught me and led me in so much about what it means and the authority that you have both um, in the natural when you own property and in the spirit. And it has been so exciting to hear from God. Um, and I want you to know that you can personally hear from God 
about what uh, your next steps are, your very exact next steps are in your life. Just like David, again, once again, inquired of the Lord and the Lord quickly answered. We must ask ourselves today, who will I be? Will I be forgiving? Will I be angry? Will I be judgmental? Will I be found faithful? Without faith, it's imp impossible to please God because we don't believe he is who he says he is. Now, um, Joyce Meyer has a funny quote that says, Lord, so far I haven't offended anybody and so on and so forth um, today. But I'm just about to get out of bed and I'm going to need a lot more help, right? So what I want to lead us in to equip us to be the love of God is you're going to have to decide today who you are. Are you love? So I want to challenge you. I want to, I want to, for, I want to start now. I want to share with you what my time looks like with the Lord. And um, I'm ashamed to say that I don't do it well. And it's like if you had a best friend and you called your friend, hey, how are you doing? Everything's great with me. Hope you have a great day. Bye. You know, it doesn't go very deep, and I have been guilty of doing that with the Lord, even even now, not like 30 years ago, but now. So the Lord is extremely patient and extremely loving, so whatever you've done or not done, it's okay. Just do better today. So when I ask myself, who will I be today? I will be a loving woman of God. That means everybody who comes into my realm will be loved. So what does that mean? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So yesterday, in my quiet time with the Lord, first thing in the morning, I'm in the practice of getting quiet, clearing everything out of my mind, and then I see Jesus. Now, this is something I'm doing in my godly imagination. So, we you know, when you start this, maybe you will imagine what his sandals might look like. You know, you imagine what his robe might look like. You might imagine what belt he's wearing or sash he's wearing today. Um, he's shown me himself in armor before. That was really good. Um, but yesterday... He loves the lake. He loves to skip rocks on the lake. And I, I hope I can keep it together, but I might not be able to. And if I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'll try to speak. Yesterday was very different. Because instead of being, I'm going to say quiet and passive, which is not my nature. <laughs> but usually when I'm before the Lord, I just, I receive I usually don't speak or ask questions, but yesterday I did for the first time. So we were there again by the lake. I didn't know what we would do. And he, he extended his arm like he would, uh, you know, extend for a lady to take your arm. So I took his arm and he walked me a little distance on the lake and he showed me across some dunes, sand dunes. A huge castle that was emanating out of it purple pink and white bright lights and it was huge it was massive it was it was like the castle that you'd see of, of a huge kingdom and very beautiful and ornate I could see it from a long distance that's how large it was and it illuminated the whole area and I knew that he was telling me this was mine this was my castle and I was so overcome with knowing. That was beautiful. And it was the only thing there. It was in the middle of a, of a desert sand dune place. But it was a castle that was alive and vibrant and beautiful and huge. And I don't know how many people it could have housed. Um, I mean, massive warehouse size castle. 
And I was just like, oh, so excited, right? Overcut. This is mine? That's so exciting. And then I turned to him and he knelt down and got closer to me because, you know, he's taller, I'm shorter. And I looked at him and I said, Jesus, what is your love language? And he looked at me and he said, he said, when you are loved, I feel loved. And it was so beautiful because it put no responsibility on me. I mean, of course, I need to be lovable, right? But still, even if I'm not lovable, and I was instantly aware of what he meant. And I knew that since he feels loved when I am loved, that when I am hated, he feels hated. When I am rejected, he feels rejected. When you are rejected, he feels rejected. When you are hated, he feels hated. When you are marginalized, when you are sidelined, when you are ignored, when you aren't made to feel important. And I realized we need to be checking ourselves for who we don't love. Because when I don't love someone, Jesus feels unloved. When I hate someone, and I don't, <clears throat> but when someone is hated, Jesus feels hated. When someone is ignored and not acknowledged, not appreciated, all of these things that are love, when we don't love, even the least of these, right? That's what the word says. He doesn't feel loved. Brothers and sisters, we've got to change this. Because the word says, your book says, we will be known as his disciples by our love for one another. And let's look also at 1 John 4. Number 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we may have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the replacement of or the penalty of paying for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And that's 7 through 12. And by this we know we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. So I want you to think about what I said. Jesus told me when I asked him, what is your love language? He answered me. He didn't say words of affirmation. He didn't say quality time. He didn't say gifts. He didn't say physical touch, which, you know, are earthly things that we've learned about. And I think there's one more I always forget when I start to recount the five. <clears throat> Jesus said, when you are loved, I feel loved. 
So that's, there's something I can do about that, right? I can be lovable, but I also, I'm, I'm called to be me. I'm called to be genuine and transparent and I'm called to, um, you know, pray with people and the Bible even says you who are more spiritual should correct a brother gently. So I'm called to correct those who call themselves of the faith gently, of course. So I do have a responsibility in always making improvement to myself. But that was not what Jesus demanded of me. That's what I want to be, right? I, you know, Jesus loves me just as I am, but he also loves me enough not to leave me that way, but to help me become the best me that I can be. So who am I going to be today? And I, am I going to be insecurity and fear and selfishness and competitive in the wrong ways? Am I going to be envious? Or will I be love? Will I show others that I am his disciple by my love for one another? And then what does that look like? How do you love? Right? Just like I mentioned, the uh, four of the five spiritual, um, four of the five love languages, I must discover how someone feels loved. And we do that through getting to know them. And we do that through just being loved, right? Here's one way to love people. So if we're going to decide who we are today, let's say I'm going to be love today. I'm going to be acceptance. I'm going to be including. I'm going to be finding people important. I'm going to be appreciative. I'm going to put other people first. I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to have the same standard for myself that I have for others. I won't be a hypocrite. So I'm going to pray, right? The spiritual discipline. I'm going to pray for others. I'm going to fast for others. I'm going to... Oh, let's talk about the prayer cloth. <clears throat> So I was given a prayer cloth this, this past weekend over which several generals of the faith have imparted their frequency through prayer for healing, for restoration, for miracles and creative miracles because of their love for God. They're loving us, loving me. So they prepared these. They released in the spirit through the frequency of their breath and their words, just as God said, light be, they spoke into this prayer cloth, this handkerchief, that we know we read from the Bible, that Peter's handkerchief, I believe it was, Peter's handkerchief healed those because of the frequency imparted through his prayer, his breath, through his love imparted here. So the greats like Cindy Jacobs prayed over this, Patricia King, Vanessa Battle, and many, many others. Many great women of God imparted their frequency into this prayer cloth, which is now mine. I add my frequency of prayer, of love to this prayer cloth. But let's say that I took this prayer cloth and I wanted to write everyone's name on here who I wanted to pray for, that I was interceding for. And I've got, you know, my six sons easily. You can, you can write their names down. You can write, um, so far I have one daughter-in-law, so I'd write my daughter-in-law's name. And I would continue down the list. And suppose I came to someone that I felt like, eh, I, I don't want to write that name on my prayer cloth. Well, guess what? That is exactly the one that God wants you to fast and pray for because you don't have peace and ease. So it is a check in your spirit that you are not loving that person. And since Jesus shared what makes him feel loved is for me to be loved, what makes Jesus feel loved is for that person that I'm reluctant to write on my prayer cloth. Maybe someone's done me wrong. Maybe um, 
someone's rejected me. Uh, maybe someone has spoken badly about me, spread rumors, lied about me. Maybe someone's just hard to get along with. We rub each other the wrong way. But when I love that person through prayer and fasting and actual love, you know, how do we love? You know, the Lord taught me, um, I think it's nine years ago. No, ten. Ten years ago. What is love? So when I discern the righteous need of that person, when I develop the ability to fulfill the righteous need for that person, and then I deliver the fulfillment of the righteous need for that person, that is love. And so I have loved the Lord when I love others. So I challenge you, if you don't have a prayer cloth, get a piece of paper, get a notebook, and write down the people who you are praying for and who you're fasting for. And when you get to that name that you can't quite make yourself write down, write it big, write it bold, and ask God to show you his point of view for that person. You may be the only Christian in that person's life willing to pray for them. So let, let's remember, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and whoever loves has been born out of God and knows God. But if you feel in your heart, I don't love that person, I've never loved that person, and, and maybe even meaner things that your heart is telling you, your heart's not right. I'm sorry, but I'm going to correct you gently. I want you to go before the Lord. When, when the Lord brings a person to your mind, or even a relationship has brought that person to your mind or to your life, and you can't love, you need to ask God his point of view for that person. And I'll share this. There was one young lady who was interested in my son. They had a relationship and suddenly one day I walked into the kitchen and in my gut, I just slammed on brakes mentally and thought to myself, oh my goodness. I hope that my daughter-in-law is not actually someone I do not like at all because this person you know, honestly, it was not likable. Lovable, we should always love. Some of the snide remarks, bad attitude, and, and ultimately violent behavior toward my son. I just made a mental, you know, stop. <clears throat> oh, Lord, my son can marry someone I don't even like. So let's suppose that's happened to you. Or there's someone at work. Or there's someone else in the family that you do not like, I challenge you. Jesus loves them. And when we love them, Jesus feels loved. Now I do pray. I've prayed since the birth of my sons to know they were sons for their wives. Since the day they were born, I prayed for their wives. And I have a, not that woman, that woman did not become my daughter-in-law. I have a beautiful daughter-in-law who respects and honors me. And asked me to lead her in spiritual things. And I do. We have a really great loving and kind relationship. But maybe you have a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, a cousin, a mother-in-law, right? Maybe it's your own mother. Maybe it's your own father. And you have not been loving. I challenge you to love. Discern the righteous need for that person. Develop the ability to fulfill that righteous need and deliver the righteous need to that person. That's love. We see this in the form of Jesus. God discerned our righteous need for a Savior. And then, of course, we know this was from the foundation of the earth. Before anything happened, he already had these plans. Then he developed through time and through Mary 
the ability to fulfill the righteous need through birthing Christ, our Savior. Then he delivered that fulfillment of the replacement for our sins because the penalty was death. So our loving God, who did make man and who said the penalty for sin or anything that separates you from me is death. I'm going to pay that price for you so you don't have to. So he delivered our righteous need for a savior, for that payment of that penalty by becoming a man and living among us and saying, don't be afraid, I've got this. And then teaching us as he was here. So as you walk through your day today, I want you to ask yourself, who am I going to be today? Am I going to be a disciple of Christ? Am I going to be a disciple of the Father? Am I going to be a disciple of the Holy Spirit? Am I going to receive the counsel and the teaching of the Holy Spirit? And then let's say you decided to be loving kindness today, but something happened that triggered you. First, I want you to know if you're triggered, what's happening is you are, it's all about you. It's still about you. It's not about the other person. So when you shift that mindset and you breathe, okay, I'm feeling triggered. I'm feeling something in my gut. <clears throat> oh, it's because it's still about me right now. So, okay, Father, give me your point of view of this person in this situation. And the Holy Spirit will tell you. Now you can step back into love and you can go forward in love. But let's say you get bent out of shape about something you're fricking, fracking, ricking, racking. Okay, take a minute. Say, hey, I need a five second break. I'll be right back. Walk down the hall, get a drink of water. Hey, say, hey, excuse me, just a minute. I'll be right back. I need to grab some coffee. I need to go to the ladies room. You go get with the Lord for a minute and get reset to who you said you were going to be today. I'm going to be loving kindness. I'm going to be generosity. I'm going to be forgiveness today. I'm going to be Jesus in skin today. I'm going to love others. So go back and say, hey, excuse me. I'm sorry. Let me start over. Right? Um, and depending upon the relationship, you might say, hey, I was just moving into something I decided I wasn't going to be today, so I had to go correct myself, and I'm back. Because that person needs to know where you are, who you are, why you did that. It was not about them. You weren't rejecting them. And they are so important that you really want to talk to them. You need to get yourself together for a moment. And if it's really something that's escalating out of control, feel free to say, you know, um, it just got emotional. Let's step back for about 20 minutes from this and let's go get a breath of fresh air, some sunshine. Let's come back and finish this up. That person knows that you find them important, that you're going to love them by coming back, and you're going to regroup and be a better person when you do. And then at the end of your day, before you're falling asleep, I want you to take a mental note of who you said you were going to be today, where you got it right, and where you need improvement, right? And then ask Holy Spirit to help you because he will. So I want to bless you. So the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you peace. May you always sense his Holy Spirit within you. May your mind, will, emotions, memories, and spirit be one as he is one. And then you be one with him. Loving others so Jesus feels loved. And I bless you today in the name of Jesus. Have a great day. Bye-bye.